A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, you have forgotten the exhortation addressed to you as children. My son, do not disdain the discipline of the Lord or lose heart when reproved by him. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He scourges every son he acknowledges. Endure your trials as discipline. God treats you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? At the time, all discipline seems a cause not for joy, but for pain. Yet later, it brings the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. So strengthen your drooping hands and your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet, that what is lame may not be disjointed, but healed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the life says the Lord, no one comes to the Father except through me. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus passed through towns and villages, teaching as he went and making his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few people be saved? He answered them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will attempt to enter, but will not be strong enough. After the master of the house has arisen and locked the door, they will stand outside knocking and saying, Lord, Open the door for us. He will say to you in reply, I do not know where you are from. And you will say, We ate and drank in your company, and you taught in our streets. Then he will say to you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all evildoers. And there will be wailing and grinding of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets of the kingdom of God, and you yourselves cast out. And people will come from the east and the west, and from the north and the south, and will recline at table in the kingdom of God. For behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. At the time... All discipline seems a cause not for joy, but for pain. Yet it brings the peaceful fruit of righteousness and those who are trained by it. This line is in the second reading today from the letter to the Hebrews. And while some of us know it's true, sometimes that pain is not a gift that we're seeking. It's not something we hope for. Can't we come by the joy that the the author of the letter speaks about by another route, by another way. Now, to begin our month in honor of St. Dominic, Father Michael, our pastor, had spoken rightly about joy and the joy in the life of St. Dominic. And joy is indeed a mark of the Dominican order. Father Michael related some stories, but as he was speaking, I had also thought of one where an early follower of St. Dominic, Blessed Reginald of Orleans, had spoken at the end of his life how he was a bit concerned because he did not suffer that much in his life, he said, but he had the joy of Christ, the joy of being in the order among brethren, among in prayer and serving the church. And he was joyful his whole life. He was concerned that he had not taken up the cross. Joy is a mark of the Dominican order. It is a mark of the church. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
Remember Father Michael emphasized that point. That is a gift, a fruit rather, of the Holy Spirit. And he had summarized the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas by saying, joy is the effect of the encounter with love. And then he had spoke about how sometimes we lack joy because of our habitual failures or faults or sins. And the example that Father Michael gave was, of course, complaining. And so we draw not only to change our ways, but putting aside sin will bring joy because it opens our heart for encounter with love of God and with others. Now, as was mentioned at the beginning of Master, today is, we have a triduum. It's a shorter three days rather than a whole novena for St. Monica this year. And she is one who struggled, I think, with joy. And I think a lot of us do in our, in our day. Thomas Merton has this wonderful passage in one of his books. One day, he, he didn't know, he didn't look at the calendar, I guess. He came in and the organ starts to swell and they're playing and there's this great music. And you know, I was supposed to be joyful. It was some feast day. And he realized what it was. But I wasn't there. I just didn't feel it. We're always told to be joyful. Joy in Christmas, joy all kinds of times. We live with a funeral to have some joy and the hope of the resurrection for those who have died. But we have to be realistic. More and more we hear, feel, I hear it in the confessional, I see it everywhere, there is a lack of joy. And sometimes we think it's our own fault, but is it? But where can that joy come from? Various things, just a short list, wounded and troubled hearts, anxieties in our life, burdens. Sometimes people are angry at us. Sometimes the psychological burdens we carry from our youth or whatever it might be. There might be a lack of forgiveness in our hearts or in our families, separation. There might be pain caused by the loss of loved ones through death or some other means. Maybe we're rejected for who we are or rejected for our faith even, even among those who are our friends and family. Maybe we're misunderstood for the way we live our life and try to live out our life as Catholics. Sometimes to be Catholic, we are already attacked because people say, well, it's your fault the world is this way. How dare you judge me and put these things upon me? And that hurts from our perspective. And like St. Monica, sometimes our children, or even our grandchildren, do not live the faith. Or our spouse. And this can be very painful. Very painful. This is a short list. Maybe there's other reasons in your life for which you lack a certain amount of joy. Do we just power through and say, hey, the Lord loves us, be joyful. Not always. And I don't think that's what the Lord necessarily expects from us. Sometimes when joy is absent, it is a real uh, challenge for us. Or in any of the burdens I just mentioned. Sometimes this can be a crisis of faith for us. Because we'll ask, where is God? Does he exist? Why doesn't he love me? Or what did I do wrong? Is this because of my sins? Am I praying wrong? What happened? Even our own struggle. Sometimes it is the things we struggle. We struggle our moral life. We say, why doesn't the Lord, the Lord stop this? Or we struggle our moral life and we don't want to change. We say, why does the Lord do this to me? Why? Why can't he just make it easy? All of these things can bring about a real pain, a real burden within our hearts that can rob us of that that joy. And again, I would propose that this isn't our fault. This is the way of life. It's just we have to look at it differently. So this three days in honor of St. Monica of a Sunday, and then Monday... Tuesday, that's her feast, we look at this woman who lived out her faith amidst the same struggles, yet in a different time, that we have. The struggles of our heart are very real. We look around the world, and there are many struggles, many trials, but we can't overlook those things which are interior as well. Most of us know a little bit about St. Monica, because she's the mother of St. Augustine. The Dominicans, by the way, follow the rule of St. Augustine. So in a way, she's especially a special saint for us as well. A great way to end our month in honor of St. Dominic. St. Monica was married as a young woman to a Roman official. But he wasn't Christian. And in fact, he wasn't just not Christian. He was really then embodied the vices particular to the Roman Empire. As St. Augustine will speak about later. He had a kind of violent temper. He was prone to all kinds of bad habits. Uh, And it seems that his mother was the same way. So, of course, St. Monica had to deal with this difficult spouse, 
and a difficult mother-in-law, and she annoyed them by her habits. She was misunderstood by them for her almsgiving, her prayer, her way of trying to live in virtue. She wasn't selfish. She tried to be a good person. She had three children that we know survived infancy, two, two brothers, one of them being Augustine, and a daughter. Unable, though, just to secure baptism for them, she grieved at this the most. Even when a young Augustine had fallen ill, her husband had agreed, okay, we can get him baptized, fine. He withdrew his promise when St. Augustine got better. All of this is difficult. It hurts. The pain of having her faith ridiculed, ridiculed rather, not respected, of having a husband that she could not share the most intimate parts of her life with, I faith, or sometimes it seems like he was also just unfaithful, who lived a different kind of moral code, who broke promises. And then, of course, the story alludes to something that we only speak about more freely today, a loss of children, infant mortality and miscarriage. Those are hard. Those are burdens that pained her heart. We know as St. Augustine grew, she was she mourned then his lack of faith, his lack of faith in the Catholic Church, that he had become Christian, but following a different sort of Christianity and Manichaeanism, a kind of odd, it's not exactly Christianity, really. It's, it's an odd sort of uh, dualism for a discussion for another time, what that's about. But all these things afflict St. Monica, and she was known to then shed copious tears for her family. So this passage from the letter of the Hebrews then urges us on, urges us on to follow the example of Christ himself. Christ who did not sin but was tempted, who struggled in this life in his own sense, that we, like him, endure tribulation and persecution because that's what it means to be Christian. We are put to the test that we might be strengthened in Christ. Again, we hear those things, but sometimes they are difficult to receive. Perhaps we'd rather choose our own way of carrying the cross. One of the things I would propose in looking at especially passions like this is to hear that lesson, yes, the Lord is guiding us. Paul, as well as the letter of the Hebrews, use examples like athleticism and sacrifice, here discipline, uh, the parent to a child to help someone grow. But I'd propose this as well. To hear this, perhaps, you know, in our own age, sometimes we can bring a new insight into something. Remember when I had mentioned Father Michael had talked about the encounter of love? The encounter of love of God, we know. We want the Lord to be our friend. We say the Lord is our brother and our friend. He says it himself. I have not called you slaves. I have called you friends. He loves us as a friend more than that. And we say we do, but much like Peter, do we? And I don't mean this because we're necessarily unfaithful, but how much do we want from God? We want our friend to give us everything. But think of a closest sort of earthly friend, a good friend. You know, you share all the joys and happiness with your friend. You share everything. You have photographs and a trip, good food, a laugh. All of these wonderful things that make up a good friendship, whether in our family or outside of our family. But you know, the real friend is always there. The real friend shares the struggles of the other. When they've been hurt, when there's loss, when they're sick, or when they've made a mistake. That's the real friendship. The Lord is that kind of friend to us. He doesn't like when we stray. He mourns for us. But he loves us all the same. And he's always there calling us home. But what about us? Do we expect only the joyful and good aspects of the Lord? The Lord shares with us the fruits of his joy, his resurrection, his teaching, his power. But he also shares with us, for reasons we might not understand, his suffering, his crown of thorns, his scourging, and his cross. He asks us to participate in this aspect of his life, too. Because we're united to him. Because he is our friend. And we then, if we take that which is good and that which is difficult on in the life of Christ, we open our hearts for him to take on that which is difficult in our life. 
St. Monica suffered. St. Monica's life was difficult at times. And she could have then despaired. She could have turned away from God. Would we have blamed her? Where was God in all of this? And yet, what does she do? She endures these inflictions. And she, rather than turning to sin like complaining or, or despair, she turns to God and asks for strength. She seeks God in faith, and she loves her husband and her mother-in-law and her children. And it's that love that eventually overcomes them. Is her heart open then to that encounter of love? That joy that maybe she didn't always feel, but that was rooted in Christ. And a faith in Christ that opened her heart for encounter with love with God and with others. And this we can learn from St. Monica. This way forward. And whatever burdens our hearts, whatever it is, in our struggles, in our family, in our people, the way the world misunderstands our faith today. And can burden us. That we then can understand Saint Monica and react differently. To live in the world trying our best to be loving, as the same time living out the truths that we hold. And the change in the way we think and pray about others. And that's what I want to talk about actually Monday and Tuesday. Monday I'm going to speak about uh, the context of, of faith as a, as a virtue and the prayer of Saint Monica as well as the prayer of St. Dominic. On Tuesday, I have to speak a little bit about the tears of St. Monica and what that means in the history of the church. What about the tears also that St. Dominic shed? So speaking a little bit about St. Monica and St. Dominic to understand a way forward for us. So that's Monday and Tuesday. Monday, the homily is after the Mass. Tuesday, it's during the Mass. Um, Excuse me. Monday, mornings, it's after the Mass, the 8 o'clock Mass. Evenings, Monday and Tuesday, it's during. And at the risk of, I don't think people are busy, um, if you're interested in, in these topics and can't come, uh, we'll post them on the St. Jude websites and social media. So if you're curious about that, I emphasize especially these things, not just for St. Monica, but again, Dominican spirituality. After Mass, as this is one of the you know, Triduum Masses, we'll have the relics, blessing of the relic. I'll be with St. Jude, I think, and Father Michael with St. Monica. And so we ask St. Monica today for us, for our world, to pray for us and to strengthen us in faith. Again, as this is a Triduum Mass, there are cards in your programs, these little cards. Let us conclude today's homily with a prayer to St. Monica, asking for, for, again, for our needs and for her to help all those who are afflicted to fruit their joy and their faith in Christ. St. Monica. Troubled wife and mother, many sorrows pierced your heart during your lifetime, yet you never despaired or lost faith. With confidence, persistence, and profound faith, you prayed daily for the conversion of your beloved husband, Patricius, and your beloved son, Augustine. Grant me that same fortitude, patience, and trust in the Lord. Intercede for me, dear St. Monica, for... And grant me the grace to accept his will in all things, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever.